Welcome to episode two of Conversations About Dying, a podcast that we've created here at Hospice Peterborough. And once again, I'm joined by David Kennedy and Red Keating. And I'm Julie Brown. And in episode two, uh, we're titling it The Challenge of Dying in a World of Living. And David, could you just kick us off? Well, I think that the, the thought for me when I hear that term is the, the challenge of dying is the reality that we are all headed in that direction. We're all going to get there. Um, but most of us never get a chance to talk about what that might be like or our own fears around those things um, because we're so consumed with getting life as much as possible that we don't want to think about that, that ending. Why do, why do you think we don't want to talk about the ending or want to think about it? Red? Well, it's difficult. Um, I, I think that <clears throat> uh, I think our attention spans have shortened even more than maybe several years ago. Um, and it's uncomfortable and it's awkward and it makes people um, sort of have to stop. And we live in a world where stopping and taking time and reflection isn't necessarily all that um rewarded or encouraged it's like we want to avoid the very fact David that you've already said that you know none of us are getting out of this alive Mm -hmm. but it's like we try to live in such a way that we're trying to ignore that critical fact and I think that's to our detriment because it's not about being morbid all of life and having this hanging over us but I think I think death actually teaches us about living better if we can allow that to happen. But I was going to say too that one of the other things that I think gets in the way of our willingness to talk about it is the, is the whole advancing in the medical world that promises us that for every illness that we have, there's going to be a solution. And certainly, you know, the, the, that, that COVID is a great example of <clears throat> when that first arrived on the scene, how the first reactions is, well, we got to fix this and we'll find, find a cure. And, but that mentality of that there's a fix for everything kind of pushes us to avoid the inevitable, that, there, that death doesn't have a fix. Right. <laughs> that there isn't this inevitable end date, that, as, I was, as I was saying. Mm-hmm. Well, he says every problem has a solution. And the solution is always positive. <laughs> and, yes. the, and the solution is right. always going to make me better. Right. And I'm not going to suffer. I'm not going to struggle. I'm not going to have any pain. All of that. And I mean, those are wonderful things to ameliorate. Like, the, who, who wants those? But they are still a part of life. And like you said, like, it's that we, we're, all gonna bo- we're all born and we're all going to die. Uh, it's the one, two things that connect us. It's the only two things that connect every human being and every life is that it, it ends. Um, and yet we have this anxiety about talking about the end. We're happy to talk about the beginning and birth and all the things in between, but when we start talking about having to say goodbye, because it is painful, because we mourn and we might feel sorrow and loss when someone that we love dies. So we, we, we hush that away. And I think that's where it, it gets in the way of us really um, <clears throat> dealing with death other than crisis, you know, some death comes when we're not prepared. That's true, the sudden death. But that's pretty, that's not the majority of death in Canada. Majority of death in Canada is, is not sudden, as much as people feel that it's sudden. Um, but I think the other piece is that because of that, it, it doesn't, A, doesn't allow us to think about what we might want at that time, or B, it, it, it there's this immediate idea that it, it will be when we're older. Mm-hmm. So we don't entertain the thought of death until we're all very old. Mm-hmm. And we always think there's a tomorrow. <laughs> you know, uh, there's, there's always tomorrow. I'll do that difficult thing tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Great procrastinators when it yeah. comes to things that make us uncomfortable yeah. and that we don't want to talk about. And, and I'll deal with that tomorrow, but there may not be a tomorrow, but we don't live in that, we can't live in that weird kind of state of always worried about Mm -hmm. the fact that we're potentially going to die. And so we carry on with all the the noise and the static that can fill our lives. I often, you know, comment on that with some of the clients 
that I'm working with who are living with life-threatening illness, say something like cancer, and you know they're grappling with their own death anxiety and this idea of you know I'm dying and you know and everyone around me isn't and they don't know what it's like and I always say well the difference is that you know death to some extent I'm going to use a very strong term is kind of stalking all of us right the difference is is like you just know yours that there's a very good chance that you know this this is true and so you can't ignore your death but the rest of us kind of walk around in this um this like we don't we don't have to pretend that it's right there and maybe it's not right there maybe it's decades away for us but we get to kind of push death off to the side like it's something as you say david way down the road you know but uh when you're living with a life-threatening illness all of a sudden you can't do that anymore it's kind of right there in the forefront it's not in the back in the same way so what do you, what do you think the advantages are if we were to allow a discussion around our death to happen? I wonder if we'd be nicer to each other. Mm. You know, I wonder if some of the things that are frivolous or some of the things that that don't matter as much might sort of drift away, and the things that do matter because. Um, you know, what do people talk about at the end of life? They don't talk about their possessions, their things. They talk about the people. Mm -hmm. They talk about the things that are important. They talk about the experiences that they had. And, and they don't talk about the cars that they drove or the need for the big house and the big money. They're stuff. They're, yeah, they're stuff because they realize you can't, you, oh, silly, you, you can't take it with you. Um, and so what do you end up, you end up talking about relationships. And if the relationships were good, you talk about them positively. And if the relationships were difficult and troublesome, they become even more difficult and troublesome at that time. And so they become, you know, I, I wonder if we, 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 we lived our lives more toward the end. If we would have had better, we would have nurtured mm. better relationships in the middle. I, I really, you just triggered something in my mind there. I, it, and I think this is true. But when we think about life, we think about accumulating. But when you talk about death, it's really about getting rid of stuff, including we're leaving, right? So, so what, makes, what makes dying really difficult in when, when you're spending your whole life accumulating is to recognize that we don't get to, as you say, we don't get to take that. What's important? And I think there's a, it's not just physical stuff we accumulate. It's the stress. It's the anxieties. It's the worry. It's all that stuff we're accumulating as if we're going to be around to fix it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's our hurts and our wounds and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, that we're carrying with us. So maybe maybe death would allow us to get rid of those things. If I, I mean, if if we could acknowledge our dying in a way that says, you know what, someday I won't be here. But why am I spending all of my time carrying around these wounds or these? That this stress that I don't need to be carrying. So there's a, what I'm hearing is like there's a perspective taking and a clarity that I think comes, you know, toward like in response to your question, David, about like what, what would it do for us if we're, t if we're talking about it, if we're aware of our death is like it, does it bring something into to focus? Does it help us, you know, remind us, pri you know, of what, of our priorities? Because you're right. You know, in the work that we do, when you ask people what's important, mm. what do they always say? They're people. Family. Yeah. They're people, yeah. right? They're relationships. And yeah. So what's important, when I say, you know, what's important to you about how you spend your time now? Just time with my family, with my friends, and feeling the connection. Or um, also finding some way to maybe let go of those things that have been hurt. Or... How do I put those down? How do I let those go? Or how do I find resolution of those? But we're certainly in a culture that, that doesn't let us do that well. I mean, we have to, you really have to work at that. I mean, yeah. even the language. <laughs> Nobody says death, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, we love, to, we have all these euphemisms, yeah. don't we, for <laughs> that, right? That, yeah. Yeah. you know, the, the person is gone, they've passed away, they've gone to a better place. Mm -hmm. I've kind of made it a little personal thing when, to, when people, when I'm talking to somebody and they say, oh, so-and-so passed away, 
I'll, I'll say, say, oh, you mean they died? <laughs> and, and actually, I did that one time with a doctor who was talking about a patient of his, and, and he said, oh, they passed away. And I said, oh, you mean they died? <clears throat> and this doctor kind of took, <laughs> took a step back and, and then wasn't sure what to do with that. But, but, but that's the reality, isn't it, that our language even challenges, makes it difficult for us to even talk about it because the language goes everywhere except there. And the language is so easy, so ubiquitous. Uh, my, one of my favorites, we lost him. We lost him a year ago. Yeah. I said, well, why haven't you found him? Like, go look for him. Where the hell, how, how irresponsible of you um, to have lost him. Um, but, that, but it's just, it's so quiet right. and so subtle that it, it, it's not even, that's not even obvious. It, it's just, it just becomes part of how we have these conversations. Whereas before, I think about, you know, my, I can hear older people telling stories of where the wake happened in the living room when so-and-so died, and, and, and death was in the house. You couldn't run from it. It was, it was in our face. And now, I, I you know, when, do, when is the last time you've been to a funeral, where the, well, we're at any funeral during COVID, but where the casket is open, you can view the body and say that last goodbye, whereas it's just direct cremation or a closed mm. casket. And, and the more and more we hand that stuff over and sort of slowly push it into the corner, the less we're able to confront and then teach young people. Um, you know, we, when we see kids here at hospice and you kind of go, we're tutoring these young people on how to, as a family, even the little family culture, how we manage death and how we treat each other during these really significant times in a family's history. And we celebrate births and we celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. And then we sort of get through death. Yeah, it's like we want to relegate it over yeah. here or push it yeah. aside. And, you know, part of that, what I think about is that this this is about our emotionally phobic society that we're in, right? Like death, um, grief, loss, it's painful. We are suffering, right? We have pain. We have lots of other feelings. We may have anger and disappointment and resentments and um, and what death does or any kind of loss really not just death it can be you know the death of a relationship or um you know a certain transition in our life it puts us in and says and our pain is right there and we have to you know back to that reference we made earlier about trying to stay busy and trying to like push forward and grief comes along and says uh-uh like i'm right here with you right and it's kind of like our shadow and it you know it's part of us and but being in our pain can feel very scary and to your point red if we also haven't had models um, in our life that have taught us that we can have big feelings and we can be in them and we can be okay right they may feel scary they may feel overwhelming but they also pass now they then another one might come as often, you know, as happens with grief, but kind of like opening ourselves to this idea that we as human beings um, have a whole range of experiences and feelings and we're meant to, we're meant to, they're, they're meant to surface and we're meant to feel them, but we have a really hard time with that. You know, we want to be positive and have positive attitudes and you know like look on the bright side of things and that's all good but not at the expense of also diminishing or trying to relegate to the side our pain and our suffering and i think one of the, the big losses out of that julie is and and I, I i've often said this with a client um when they say to me you know well i've i'm just going to be i'm just being strong because there's young children and I can't cry. I want to be strong for them. And my response is, is that idea of how are, what are you modeling for your, those children? So you're telling them that when somebody dies, um, you don't have those feelings of sadness and grief. You can't express them. Um, and that you, you're, you're okay, you're strong. When in fact, that's not strength. Um, tr pretending to be something outside that's different then the truth that's inside is not strength. Um, being strong is being able to express what's true. And so when you, when you present something to children that, that says, oh, you know, grief is not hard, death is not hard, um, 
when they experience it, when you die, then they say, well, you know, mom didn't cry. Why am I crying? So you, it's back to what you said very early, Red, is that there's no models of what death means or how we deal with death. And, um, you know, I was going to just raise that point, too, around um, death has death is generally seen as failure. Yes. Um, and um, I, I think that's true in medicine. Um, and and I'm hopeful that we're going to have a, a, one of our podcasts with a palliative doctor to be able to talk about that perspective in medicine. But one of the things that I've and, and I love having these conversations because where else can you have them? Right. But but one of the things that I love to do when we have our honor guard uh, just before we that person leaves hospice, um, I will just talk to them. And one of the things I say to them is congratulations you're successful you did what you came here to do and that was to die mm -hmm. and you did it mm. good for you and and and, and, and we I, celebrate we, we honor that we honor that yeah and 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 rather but how can you do that if you if you don't want to deal with death mm -hmm. <laughs> you'll, you'll never see that as something that you've accomplished and and we are all living but we all are going to die. Mm -hmm. But how are we going to accomplish death in a way that, that that's not something that we need to, 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 to avoid to talk about? Mm -hmm. I want to pull back to what you just said on something there, David, and I'm not sure if my thought is fully formed yet, but it has something to do with the concept of strength in our society and what makes us strong, and we need to be strong, and uh, it's independence. You know, if we're strong and capable if we're independent, standing on our own two feet, we don't need anybody, and we're young and youthful, and we've got energy and power, and we're making and moving and shaking. Uh, as we get older, um, maybe those qualities <laughs> are a little bit harder to hold on to, but what it negates is our sense of interconnectedness um, and our reliance on each other. So if our goal is independence, and that equals strong and success, when we become reliant and interdependent and are dying, then we have failure. But we've been watching on Netflix a few things, and the theme in, in, the, in the episodes, and they've been sort of more nature things, is the interconnectedness yeah. of everything mm -hmm. in the world. Yep. Um, and so we have this illusion or this delusion of independence and is king, and it means I'm strong and powerful. And then we lose that sense of when I need you, when I need to lean on you, when I can't stand up myself, there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. As opposed to saying, I'm in this position and I can lean to my right and there's someone to prop me back up. And I can lean to my left and there's someone there to prop me back up. And having those relationships and those connections are what make us strong. Because nobody is strong on their own. Nobody's independent on their own. You know? We're really getting into the territory there of vulnerability really right you know and uh, thankful to Brene Brown and how much she has raised this point in our world but really that you know asking for help leaning doing that leaning and allowing ourselves to lean um, is really vulnerable for people it can feel very exposing to say I need you I need help I can't do this on my own um, it's exposing for us to do it's a brave thing to do but but a necessity and, and that's what death teaches us, right? That's right. We can't do death all on our own. Right. We need people. I mean, and, and even to care for the body after death, we can't do that ourselves. Right. We need that, that, that piece. <clears throat> but if all of life, as you say, Brett, if life is this instilling of independence, then, then, then we, we're really going to be afraid to talk about our own dying. Right. So something we talk about, the three of us, often when we are having some of our don't share all our secrets <laughs> <laughs> yeah we have to save some stuff for future podcasts too don't we uh we talk about this terror management theory and i'm wondering if one of you would just kind of give oh, a God. really high level overview recognizing that none of us are experts on this but it is something we refer to often in our work so that is a bunch of um experimental psychologists and cultural anthropologists uh, um, uh, Sheldon Solomon is the name that comes to mind as one of the people that have studied this and they they basically say that um, without getting into too much detail that that one of the things that buffers us 
from the anxiety of the fact that we know that someday we're going to die. So what buffers us from our death anxiety is the creation of culture. And so if we can subscribe to the tenets of a culture really clearly and follow all the rules inside that culture, then that sort of helps us uh, buffer us from our anxiety and our knowledge that someday we're going to die. Um, and then when we then bump into other cultures or other people that think differently, that creates that anxiety in us. And so we have to sort of double down on our own culture in order to feel safe again. And so one of the things that buffers us from our death anxiety is the creation of culture. And you can see different cultures have different takes and how they view death and how they respond to death and how they sort of manage death inside the bubble of their own culture. Um, and that's, just, that's a really, really short and down and dirty sort of um, definition or ex explanation of terror management theory. But it, it holds so much power in, in, in that it can be applied to so many different situations. Um, but it, that sense of if, if I'm doing everything right inside my culture, then my anxiety is, mm -hmm. is, is well managed <clears throat> and ameliorated, and I can carry on doing what I need to do and pretend like I, yeah, yeah pretend that death is, is somewhere way, way down the road and not maybe just tapping me on the shoulder. Costabon introduced the term death culture um, back in the early 80s, I believe, where, <clears throat> where he took that idea of how have we as a culture um, organized ourselves around death and financially, um, psychologically, medically, all those pieces. Um, but we do, we do set up that. Um, and I, I, I think our own fear of death, and, and if we come back, you use that term that we talk about a lot about death anxieties. <clears throat> when I ask, it's interesting, I don't know your experience, it'd be interesting to hear, but when I, when I ask clients about how they feel about death as they are living with a life-threatening illness and knowing that it's coming, often I hear it's not, I'm not afraid of death, I'm afraid of two things, dying. Uh, the process to get there is one, the biggest one that we struggle with. But the other is, it's not about, and I've thought about this in my own life too, it, that the greatest anxiety of death is about who I'm going to be leaving. Mm -hmm. And again, that, maybe that's important to, to, to really spend some time thinking about that in order that it might allow me to live better now, as what you both had alluded to earlier. But um, it, 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 it's interesting that idea of death, of what it, the anxieties more have to do about what's going to happen to people after I'm gone. I would agree that that is something I consistently hear in response to that conversation as well, David, is the anxiety and the fears, the pain, is often thinking and knowing about the pain of the people that they're leaving, that will still be alive. Wondering how they will be, how they will cope, how, yeah. And, and again, because we as a culture haven't had, you know, even grief gets pushed aside. So we don't have, uh, we, we don't have the, the welcoming uh, awareness of grief as a normal process. Mm -hmm. So that that fear is even, you know, I, 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 often people will say, well, you know, are you, will you stay in contact with them? Will you look after them? There's this need to, 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 to make sure that people are looked after after they're, they're dead. But, yes. but the fact is that, that people have to actually focus on that because it's not a normal reaction in our culture. We don't normally embrace people's grief. We, we try to fix it and mm -hmm. get it over with as fast as possible. Oh, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> that will be another episode for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sure. And I've, I've been listening and I've been thinking in the back of my head and something has just dawned on me. Um, and we've, we've talked about terror management quite a bit in the role of culture, but I think one of the things that it really talks about, and, and what we're talking about here is them not talking about death, and maybe being more open about it, and having it be um, something that we learn to manage in our lives differently, is that terror management is saying that the, the, the differences in culture have, and, and, and our ability to sort of buffer ourselves from our own anxiety, has really been at the root of a lot of destructive behavior, a lot of things mm -hmm. that are not good in the world. Prejudice and bigotry, you know, 
mm-hmm. of war, uh, po- and they get political and religious differences, start to become seen as threats. And so then we hold those things in a different regard, and it's not a higher regard usually, if they're a threat. And if it's a threat, we have to get rid of it. And so our death-denying culture has re- really, when you think about it, can be the root of a lot of death and destruction and and really sort of negative things that people have done to each other throughout history uh, and throughout time. And I'm just thinking about how we can hold different views of, of different types of people who, who have a different lifestyle or people who have a different faith base or people who have a different political sense. They become threats. And as a result, that almost justifies us denigrating them or berating them or, or putting them down um, mm-hmm. uh, and, and justifies maybe some of our more uh, negative and violent behavior towards certain sections of our population. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that sort of, that just has come to me sitting here thinking, yeah. and, I mean, if we, we've talked about it a lot, but uh, wow, that really can be the root of a lot of destructive behavior inside our societies, inside our cultures. Well, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right, and I'm, I'm listening to you, Red, and my mind is going the fact that, <clears throat> you know, often when it's the other, it's that, that quite often the fear that gets brought up in that is the fear that, that they're going to harm us yeah. or kill us. That's right? Right. And so you end up with that yeah. becomes that the motivation yeah. that feeds all of the prejudice and feeds yeah. the, the response. I'll yeah. get you before you can get me. Isn't that true? Yeah. yeah. And what Tara mentioned, what, what, what they'll say is that the first thing you do when you come up against something different is um, you berate it, you put it down, you belittle it. Yeah. And if that doesn't work, well, you try to convert it to your way of thinking because the more people that see the world the way I do, the stronger my point of view, the better. The safer and, I'll feel. And then if you can't, if that doesn't work, well, then you just kill them. Right. You get rid of them. Right. You have war. You have, yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you, you eliminate that population and therefore my population is bigger and stronger and we're going we're gonna to kick your butt and we're going to show you that we're better. And our way of looking at the world is, is the superior way. And you didn't listen to us, so now we're going to get rid of you. That's, that's a, we don't need to go to war to destroy people, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so I guess, the, 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 and, I, and I, as we wrap this up, I think, uh, but what I'm sitting here thinking. On is, such okay. a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> so where do, we, where do we begin with you know, if, if, if with this idea of we need to talk more about death, like how do we do that? Um, how does it become a natural rather than this fearful topic? So David, I know that you used to do pre-COVID death cafes mm-hmm. in downtown Peterborough mm-hmm. here, um, trying to, I think, encourage some mm-hmm. of that, right? And kind of bringing it, you know, welcoming people to a space where we could start to have some of these conversations. Could, would you mind sharing with us just mm-hmm. maybe a few of the questions or conversation starters mm-hmm. you did to mm-hmm. encourage that discussion? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, I, I, I really enjoyed those and I'd love to do more of those, but they were, it, it, it's basically a, a time when, and it's not about, it's not about um, um, getting other people to believe what you believe. It's not about trying to change what you believe. It's about simply examining, what do I think about my death? Um, so the questions ranged from from very practical things like if you had a choice, who do you want to be there when you die, or would you want music there? What what where would you want to die? Those kinds of things. Uh, but again, that's part of what. And again, this move to advanced care planning, which is a whole other time. But this idea of how do we begin that discussion around our own dying, and why would we? What's important? What do I want my family to know about what's important to me when I come to that point? Um, who do I want to be there? Who don't I want to be there as much as who I do? Yes. Right? So I think those death cafe points were really meant to explore uh, those questions. Some of them were practical, some were philosophical. Mm-hmm. Um, what does death mean to you? Mm-hmm. Um, is, is, is in that, and that's a piece of our own journey. And again, not, not as something that we need to persuade others in. But what is where do where am I at that? What are my fears around that? Um, so it's less about, as you're saying, it's not about the answers. Not that those aren't important, but it's really about creating the pause, and just 
kind of stepping into some of that, feeling our anxiety, or even, you know, to use that word terror, if we have that around death, and just stepping into it and spending a little bit of time there, touching it. Normalizing. Normalizing it. Is that, is that it. possible? Even practicing saying the word. Saying the word. Right? And looking around at nature. Death is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And why don't we why don't we talk about that? Mm -hmm. Why don't we help you know, everything dies. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's mm -hmm. not and even saying that language it makes people hesitate. Mm -hmm. right? like, it's not that I go none of us go around talking about it all the time. Mm -hmm. But can we and I love that idea, can we begin small by just using the death word? Mm -hmm. Using a D word. Mm -hmm. The D word. Red, anything that you you'd like well, to say about? Well, I'm just I'm 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 uh, for, you brought up terror management theory, so my head has stayed there. But listening to you, David, sort of like maybe we could find other ways to buffer our anxiety. Maybe it wouldn't be so anxiety provoking if we didn't push it off into a dark corner and say we're not going to talk about that fearful thing, because if maybe if I if I shone some light on it, it wouldn't be so fearful, and I could find another way to live my life, and it, maybe not with that anxiety is running so high. Um, and just as Jeff Greenberg, Sheldon Solomon, and Tom Bazinski, I thought we should name them as sort of the, the fathers of terror management Thank theory. You. I couldn't remember their names at the moment, but um, uh, those are the names that we're sort of referring to. But like, like that a Death Cafe, I can imagine people would be running from something like that. But then there's going to be that group of people. Then maybe the world would be a happier, less destructive place if we, if we just found another way of dealing with our fear of death. I'm, um, I think that that is a great way, place to end it for today is, you know, to practice saying the D word to, you know, as I said, um, you know, creating that space red, you're saying to, can we find ways to maybe look at our anxiety, you know, invite it in rather than running away. That's a real, um, passionate topic for me so it's maybe the George that... Costanza do the opposite thing right. you know like <laughs> you do the opposite it might work out you right. know I think that'll Seinfeld that'll be a whole other um episode so uh thanks everyone thank you Julie thanks David good